uh, church and family. This week, uh, it'll be Richard and Karen Bogar, Gary and Sherry Fuhr, Noble and Noel and Noble Gill, Bill and Melissa Hansen, Elizabeth Hoffs, Linda Johnson, Michael and Cindy Pauley, Roy and Elvia Sprague, Harry Toomey, Vern Hardy, Dan and Robin Symbol. Give thanks for his steadfast love towards this body of believers. Give thanks for maintaining a people devoted to the Bible and pray for continued obedience and love. Pray for our families to grow in love for one another. Uh, the missions, we got NICE, uh, which is Northwest Independent Church Extension, Isaiah 61 International, uh, Samaritan's Purse, which we do Operation Christmas Child through, uh, Slavic Gospel Mission, uh, MAF, Missionary Aviation Fellowship, and Overseas Missionary Fellowship, Union Gospel Mission, and uh, CRU, Ukraine. In civil prayer, we give thanks for our ability to freely worship the triune God. Pray that God would destroy the works, prophets of sin in our country. Pray for the president, state, and local government. Pray for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who serve around the world. That's a lot to pray for. You guys are going to be busy this week. Uh Okay, we'll go to announcements. Sunday evening service, uh, sing Rico Tice Encounters with Jesus. And that's tonight between 6 p.m. and 7.15. Uh, women's Bible study is on Monday, 7 to 9 p.m. and Thursday, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Prayer group, Wednesday at 10 a.m. FD group. Thursday at 6.30 p.m. We're, we're the Faithful Discipleship Group. So if you'd like to, if you'd like to join us on Thursdays, Thursday evenings uh, for our Faithful Disciples Group, this week we'll be meeting at our house. Oh, okay. That's, um, what is, oh, so, okay. Yeah, and then Sunday school class at uh, sun at nine thirty a.m. We had and, uh, upcoming events: women's conference, prayer movie, war room, Saturday, August Octo October twenty first, ten a.m. to two p.m. And um, again, there's a, a flight. There, you have gone to to invite. That would be great. Please don't forget to bring a lunch and uh, drinks, and uh, we'll be just pray for this. And and if you're a woman, come out and join us. And you got to do your own thing. We're hunting this time here. Right. <laughs> Operation Christmas Child uh, shoebox party Fridays, November seventeenth. Uh, that'll be at 6 p.m. Him Sing and Pi Social is going to be Wednesday, November 22nd at 6 p.m. A uh, special Christmas monologue with Becky Small will be Saturday, uh, December 23rd. I guess we haven't picked a time yet. Uh, Christmas Eve breakfast, Sunday, December 24th, 9.30 a.m. And Christmas Eve service, Sunday, December 24th, 6 p.m. Other announcements, we have two ministries in need of people. Please pray for, prayerfully consider serving in one of these. Kitchen ministry, helping with cleanup after the morning services. And the bereavement ministry, helping with setup and cleanup for funerals. Vis visitation and comforting afterwards. Uh, pray for Becky Small, Sharon Small, and the short-term mission team, uh, Uganda on October 26th through November 22nd. And that's it. 
I have two videos to share with you. Hopefully this new format will be helpful to you all in the bulletins. Um, if you notice, it's all stuck together now. But if you really want to cut it in half and put it in your Bible, then you will have the hymn of the month along with the, the weekly prayer. If you cut that piece off, you won't lose all of that spiritual part. And then if you want to put something on your fridge, you can cut this off, put the announcements for the week. Um, and then also uh, suggestions for Operation Christmas Child are on the back of, of that half of the bulletin. So I hope that is helpful to you. Uh, but I wanted to share two videos with you. One uh, in, in awareness of missions is for Operation Christmas Child. As we're getting ready for our packing party, we want to share a little video um, because the shoeboxes actually do benefit children around the world. It actually does um, provide opportunity for children's lives to be changed for the good of God's kingdom. And so this is one story of, of a young man who received a shoebox gift and God did a work in his life. My name is Emmanuel, and I'm from Uganda. My dad, they are led a ministry, and we did well. Life then dramatically changed when he went to attend a conference in the UK, and he got visa issues, and he wasn't able to come back as we had expected. Mom had to come in to support the ministry and the family financially. We went through a desert, poverty, and scarcity of literally everything. Getting meals was a miracle. On a good day, we had two. On a bad day, we would have porridge, and that was it. It was in that wilderness that my mom met a lady from Operation Christmas Child. We kids were gathered, and we couldn't help but wait expectantly to receive our shoeboxes. The day that I received my shoebox was a very special day. I really felt like God was telling me, Emmanuel, I love you. I know you. Your name is written in the palm of my hand. I opened it, and the first thing that hit me was the sweet smell. But there was still one thing that I hadn't seen right below the box, and that was the harmonica. The harmonica resonated with me. It was such a special and personal gift, because it was a musical instrument, and I am a musician. I want to share with you a song that my teacher taught me. Beloved, you will never know what a shoebox means to people like me in Africa. It's a big gift that comes in a small package. It's a ray of light in the darkness. It's a sound of sweet melody amidst the noise. It's a river in the desert. Our family was also able to uh, go this week and see firsthand uh, another young man who received a shoebox who was also from Africa. Uh, he's now 28. He's actually come to America. He's becoming a citizen. He's actually joined our military now. But the Lord reached his heart as well through the shoeboxes. So I want to thank you all for being a part of this ministry and, and what you do to support and to give to the Operations Christmas Child. The other thing that we, uh, one of the other missionaries that we support is the crew, the yellow boxes for Ukraine. And uh, that's come up since the uh, war between Russia and Ukraine. We have the opportunity through Campus Crusade Ministries to support them in these yellow boxes. Now, the yellow boxes are boxes that provide food and other items of need to the people who are affected by the war, but it's also an opportunity for the missionaries to, to take those boxes in and to actually share the gospel with the families. And not just once, they do it four times a month. Every week, they take a, a box of food to a family and then spend time ministering to that family in their spiritual needs as well. So it's a very practical gift, but it's also a very spiritual gift. And so here's a short little message about it. Since it's not something we've um, come quite out and shared with you, I wanted to share this new video with you so you would see what we are supporting as a church. Dear friends, my name is Sasha Zibaro, and I'm speaking to you from Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, today is September 21st. Uh, lots of people in Kiev woke up around uh, 4 a.m. because of massive uh, missile attack. Uh, we had about 43 missiles uh, that Russian Federation 
sent to Ukraine, about 20 of them, they were trying to target some uh, objects in the city of Kyiv. Praise God, he protected us, and today, is, uh, today I'm at the warehouse. In Kyiv, we are our staff and volunteers working on making these yellow boxes and military boxes. Uh, this is our strategy, how we are uh, reaching uh, internally displaced people and Ukrainian refugees, as well as Ukrainian uh, military uh, people. And uh, behind me, you can see a group of uh, staff and volunteers from different churches who came here to help us to put all this food and uh, uh, booklets together into these boxes, and today and tomorrow, uh, all these boxes will go to different places in Ukraine. So far, we distributed more than 85,000 of yellow boxes and a couple thousand of military boxes, and it's just the beginning. We will go uh, on Saturday, me and a group of staff will go to the city of Zaporizhia, southern eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, to bring some humanitarian aid to the church that we are partnering with. And also we want to visit uh, a few uh, staff who are in the military right now, and uh, we will bring down these military boxes. I want to say thank you for your part, uh, for being part of our ministry in Ukraine. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your financial support. Uh, thank you for standing with Ukraine. Um, thank you very much. May God bless you. So as both of these ministries are on this week's selection of missions to specifically be praying for, um, take note of these two videos and use them as a guide in your prayer to continue to lift them up before the Lord. Oh, we know what the yellow box is. <laughs> okay, let's go to the Lord prayer and prepare ourselves for the worship uh, and praise in the Lord. Is it? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for bringing us here, and we just pray that you give us voices that will be pleasing to you. Uh, Lord, we know it's it's all about you, and it ain't about how our voices sound, and just that you want to hear praise out of us, Lord. And we just thank you and pray that you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All People That On Earth Do Dwell is our hymn of the month. For October it was written over 400 years ago and printed in the first English Psalter. This hymn is the oldest English hymn text that we sing, because other hymns with earlier dates were translations from German, Latin, or Greek. William Keth was a Scotsman and a minister in the Church of England during the reign of Queen Mary. The persecution of Protestants was so severe that public singing ceased almost entirely. Protestants fled England to escape persecution. Heth fled to Germany where he was greatly influenced by John Calvin and the forms of worship in the Reformed movement. When he later returned to Scotland, he and his friends were impressed with the Scottish Psalter and created the Genevan Psalter. All people that on earth do dwell is a poetic and metrical setting of Psalm 100 and is now sung today. Would you stand as we open with this hymn of the month? All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with fear, his praise for them. Come ye before him and rejoice. The Lord ye know is God indeed. Without our aid he did us make. We are his folk, he doth us feed. And for his sheep he doth us take. Oh, enter then his gates with praise. Approach with joy his courts unto. Praise Lord and bless his name always. For it is seemly so to do. For why the Lord our God is. 
is good. His mercy is forever sure. His truth at all times firmly stood. And shall from age to age endure. To Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the God whom heaven and earth adore, from man and from the angels, be praise and glory evermore. The mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to his craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing, dost ask who that may be, Christ Jesus it is he, Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, one little word shall fail him, that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through Him who with us sided. Let good and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may give. God's truth abideth still, His kingdom is forever. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. The 
steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. is more. What love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without thought or more sure. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more you may be seated The sands of time are sinking, the dawn of heaven breaks. The summer morn I 
I've sighed for the fair sweet morn awaits. Dark, dark hath been the midnight, but day spring is at hand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. O Christ, he is the fountain, the deep sweet well of love. The streams on earth I've tasted, more deep I'll drink above. There to an ocean fullness his mercy doth expand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Oh, I am my beloved's, and my beloved's mine. He brings a poor vile sinner into his house of wine. I stand upon his merit, I know no other stand, not in where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. The bright eyes, not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my King of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand. The Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. How sweet it is to sing of our heavenly home, of that great hope and encouragement and comfort we have in Christ Jesus, and yet to know that for all that's promised to us, heaven, mansions bright, streets paved with gold, crowns of glory for our service to the Lord, all those pale in comparison with a look at Jesus Christ, just to see his face, just to know he is there and behold him face to face. That is our hope and our joy. Well, children, if you'd like to come up for our story. Hmm. I see the cold has even gotten to bushy tail Bob here. Well, oh, there we go. Got to put his legs back in order. Hmm. There we go. Boy, just wait until you get old and your legs get <laughs> stiff. <laughs> yeah, you'll wake up in the morning and have to drink a cup of WD-40 to get started. Mm hmm. All right. Well, last week we were looking at Psalm 51. Anybody remember what that talk tells us about? Psalm 51 teaches us how we're to ask God for forgiveness. Say that. How to ask God for forgiveness. It's so important that we do that, isn't it? I'm sure you're learning at home too how important it is to ask forgiveness when you've done something wrong, or are you just perfect children? Probably. No, we're not, are we? We all have a sin nature, and we all have a need to come and ask for forgiveness of one another, of our parents, of our friends, and most importantly, to ask forgiveness of God, who alone can forgive us of our sin and who can wash us clean. Our parents can't do that, can they? And your brothers and sisters, they can't. Can I look up here? Your brothers and sisters can't forgive you of all your sin, can they? They can't wash it away, but... but Christ can, God can, through this, the work of Jesus on the cross. So how to ask God for forgiveness? Well, sometimes, last week we had talked about you've been caught doing something wrong. Remember, Slim had got caught 
feeling that delicious egg for breakfast? Mm-hmm. He had to ask forgiveness for that, didn't he? Well, sin is like a disease. It kind of spreads, kind of like a sickness. Do you know that? And it's no different at the pond. Not every day is a good day at the pond. These three hooligans had gotten together, and they had decided to do something also that was terrible. They had decided to go out and create trouble. They were playing at first, building mud castles and stuff down by the beach. Then they thought, oh, wouldn't it be so funny if we took this mud and we threw it up into the tree? And so it started. Until all of a sudden. But he did. He looked up there and he said, guess what? There's a door up there. Lump of mud. right on the window. They all hooted and hollered and thought that was great. Then they continued to throw mud until that whole window was just covered. Yeah, for children it does, I'm sure. Yes, I think it's yeah. Really? A little bit. There we go. A little honesty. Okay. Well, they continued to play the game, and then they did it. And then they found another covering. Do you think that makes every animal cre creature happy? Especially Ed, his little outing out in the field, and he came home. And we had, oh, my door's covered in mud. We hurried inside. I'm going to go and see who it was. And you know what? He looked out the window. He went down to where he saw a few. Uh, hey, fellas. You know why there's mud all over my window and my door? Oh, I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know how that could have happened. Well, Bushy Tail Bob looked up and went. He said, well, Bushy Tail Bob. Uh, uh, me? No, I, I, no I, I don't think so. And he looked at the last one. He said, Sam Squirrel, was it you? And Sam went. <laughs> to which Bushytail Bob looked over and he said, oh, yeah, Sam Squirrel. He can't hear and he, he can't talk anymore all of a sudden. Yeah. Has that problem ever happened to you? Oh, well, Edgar said, don't worry. I'm going to call in my favorite friend, a private and guest investigator who will figure this out. He called him in. Well, Baltimore came flying down. He said, no worries, Edgar. My name is Baltimore P.I., private eye. I'll investigate everything. Nothing escapes my eye. Yeah, it is pretty silly, isn't it? But you know what? When David sinned against God and Nathan the prophet came and confronted him with his sin and told him what his sin was and asked him, did you commit this sin before the Lord? David had to confess his sin, didn't he? He had to repent and ask, his for, ask God for forgiveness. David didn't make excuses. He wasn't like those three squirrels and chipmunks. He didn't make excuses. He knew he had sinned against God. We see that in Psalm 51, verses 3 through 4. David also knew God could take away his sin in verses 1 and 2, and also 7 and 10. David humbled himself by sharing his confession with all the people of Israel through this song. He hoped we could learn from his mistake. Whenever we sin, we can follow David's prayer and admit our wrong and ask God to forgive us. That will be every day, won't it? It will be every day. We have to come to him and ask for forgiveness. We know even more about the forgiveness of sins today than David did then. We know for sure that God will forgive us because Jesus paid for our sins when he died on the cross. When you tell God you are sorry for your sins, that's called repenting, and then you trust in Jesus, you believe in him, you can be sure that you are forgiven by God. He won't hold your sin against you. Now, here's a few questions I want you to think about, okay? You don't have to answer the questions right now, but I want you to think about them and take them home with you. Do you have any sins to confess to God today? 
where do you need forgiveness? What sins do you need forgiveness for all your sins? But if you're thinking of, you have sin that you need to confess to God, where do you need forgiveness? God welcomes you to walk in the light, just like David. He welcomes you to repent of your sin, to confess and ask God for forgiveness. So it's very important that we take some time to think about, Lord, open my heart. Tell me the sin that's in my life so that I can confess it and be right with you. Because God wants to create a people who are holy, who are right, who do what is right, who delight in him. And we won't delight in God if our heart is full of sin. No, because that sin clouds it up like that window. It makes it dark so we can't see. Confessing and repenting of our sin, asking forgiveness, washes that clean, washes it so that we can see the world the way God would have us to see it. We can see him the way he would have us to see him. So if you find that you get caught doing something you shouldn't, rather than making excuses, don't make excuses or say, it wasn't me or I don't know who did it. Rather than excuses, confess your sin was me. I did what was wrong. Will you please forgive me? And then go immediately in prayer to God and say, oh God, I did what was wrong and tell him what it was. Even though he knows all things, he wants to hear your heart. Now, God, will you please forgive me? This is sin in my heart and I want it to be taken away from me. I don't want to steal anymore. Or, oh God, I don't want to lie anymore. You take no pleasure in lying. Will you please forgive me of that and wash it? Okay? So it's a very serious thing, but it's also a wonderful thing because we know that God is faithful, just to what? Forgive us our sins and our trespasses if we will confess to him. Okay? So use Psalm 51 as a reminder and a help to you to ask forgiveness for your sin. All right? And the verse is, verse 1, have mercy on me, O God. Can you say that? Have mercy on me, O God. That means to not get the judgment that we, re- that we deserve. Have mercy on me. Don't give me the punishment I deserve. According to your steadfast love. See that? According to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy. See that? According to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Blot out my transgressions. Heavenly Father, we thank you that with you there is plenteous grace and mercy to be found. With you there is forgiveness for sin. If we will but come before you and and repent, confessing that we are wrong and asking for forgiveness, we thank you that you are a God who is just and in, in your presence there is nothing unholy. There's only purity and beauty and glory. So I pray that you would continue your good work in us, and especially in these children, that they would be quick to confess their sin and quick to turn to you and ask for forgiveness. And they would find with you that you are a forgiving God and that you will wash them clean of their sin and you will make it so that they can see you as you are, that they they will delight in you. They will walk in your ways. I pray that you would help us this week by your spirit to be honoring to you, to be pleasing to you. We lift high the name of Jesus, our wonderful Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name. Scripture reading will be in Psalms, chapter 83. God, do not keep silent. Do not be deaf. God, do not be quiet. See how your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have acted arrogantly. They devise clever schemes against your people. They conspire against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation so that Israel's name will no longer be remembered. For they have conspired with one mind. They form an alliance against you. And then uh, 13 through 18. Make them like tumbleweed, my God. 
like straw before the wind, as fire burns a forest, as a flame blazes through the mountains. So pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame so that they will seek your name, Lord. Let them be put to shame and terrified forever. Let them perish in disgrace. May they know that you alone whose name is the Lord, are the most high over the whole earth. Dear Heavenly Father, we think of Israel as what they're going through right now, and we pray this prayer, Lord, that you would uh, fight with them, Lord, and destroy their enemies. Father, we pray that you'd be with us uh, in this service, Lord, that you would keep our hearts uh, open to all your words, Lord, that our ears would be attentive to everything you have for us today. Be with Pastor Caleb as he teaches us, Lord. Just pray that the Holy Spirit would guide him through all that he has for us, Lord. Just uh, bless us in Jesus' name. What a passage there, Psalm 83. And uh, really struck me this week as, as a psalm that could have been sung or prayed in Isaiah's day as well as we'll see this morning from Isaiah chapter 9, but how applicable it is to us today as well. So you see how all of Scripture is timeless in its word and timeless in its help and in in our time of need. Last week, we saw from verses 6 and 7 how the humanity of Jesus helps us to have faith and is confirmed through his birth how the deity of Jesus helps us to love God in reverence and worship of him as the true and living God. And how the sovereignty of Jesus helps us to hope and to press on, looking for the blessed and glorious day when he will appear again to rule and reign forever. A child is born, a son is given, his name is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And all of that's accomplished through the zeal of the Lord of hosts. Boy, isn't God good? Have you found that to be true? Is God good? Do you know him as a God who is good? Have you found that it's pleasant to meditate on his loving kindness and his grace? But do you also consider the wrath of a holy God? It's not something we really like to talk about. We like to talk about God's mercy and his forgiveness and his grace wonderful, true qualities of who he is. But he wouldn't quite be these things without the balance of a God who is angry, a God who has wrath against injustice, one who is just. So it's important that we have a balanced approach towards God. For all mercy, grace, and love is not all that it can be if we ignore, if we do not recognize the judgment for our sin. So it comes to a very sobering poem here in Isaiah 9, verses 8 through 10, verse 4. What of the men who ignore the word of the Lord? What happens to them? First Samuel says, those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So God is one who extends honor to those who give honor to him, but there is also judgment for those who do not turn to him. There are four areas of sin here in this passage that we'll see that the Lord is setting forth to declare judgment on. The first is pride and arrogance. Secondly, irreligion or hard-heartedness. Thirdly, wickedness and selfishness. And fourthly, injustice or unrighteousness. For when disaster strikes, judgment falls after the pursuit of sinful ways. But man's common response to these is usually arrogance or hard-heartedness. It's selfishness or injustice. Because the one builds off of the other that came before. It doesn't always start out so blatantly. We don't always just come out in arrogance. We don't always harden our heart right away. It's a process that happens over time. We are increasingly more inclined to try and overcome our troubles, aren't we? Rather than stopping and considering... What are these troubles that are coming upon us, either personally or as a nation? 
they may be designed for our chastening. They may be designed to point us back to the God of mercy and of truth. And that's what I would like for us to see, as Isaiah points out from this passage this morning. So to despise the correction of the Lord has as its root these four core points. He permits men and nations to go just so far in their own sinful way before bearing down in discipline. And this poem warns of the calamities that will fall on Israel for not heeding the word of God, which was previously made known to them. Isaiah uses Israel, that of the northern kingdom, as an object lesson to the southern kingdom, that God does not take sin lightly. So follow along in Isaiah chapter 9, as we read verses 8 through 12. The Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and spur his enemies on. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. It was a pride and arrogance that came over the people at first. For the Lord had sent his word. It was a sign of his mercy that extend, in extending warnings to them. He didn't just come out in judgment and wipe them out, but he sent his word as a warning. But when the judgment fell, all the people would know it. But then how would all of the people respond? They responded in pride and arrogance. As I thought about this first stanza of this poem, I couldn't help but think of this as being called the Build Back Better plan. And no, it's not a political statement, but our our president, our president, his, his office was not the first to come, with that, come up with that, was he? Because look at what they said. Even though the punishment was severe, it wiped out people. It would wipe out buildings. Here they stood, shaking their fists back at God and declaring, we built, we built with bricks and that fell over. So we'll use richer material of cut stone, hewn stone, not clay bricks made by hand. We'll take stone and cut it out and build ourselves nice houses. It won't fall over. Rather than sycamores, which were a, a tree that is very easy to come by, is a very cheap tree there in Israel, we'll rebuild with cedars, mm, something that has a beautiful scent, then something that's strong, that will last. Because we are self-sufficient, we are strong. It was a haughty attitude. They thought that they would have control of the situation, and yet they refused to acknowledge that all things are in God's hand. So pride elevates oneself to the position of highest authority. It puffs up their thoughts towards themselves. Pride is essentially when we take the place of God in our hearts. Whether it's as creator, we built this and it didn't stand, so we're going to build something better, something that's going to last. We're going to disregard God's judgment over us. Whether it's as divine authority, we have the power to do this. Whether it's as omnipotent, we are strong, we are all-powerful. Or whether it's as omniscient, we know what we need, we can do this on our own. That's the attitude that pride takes. That's what the northern kingdom was doing. They were vaunting themselves. In spite of the calamities that fell, they stood up and said, that's all right, we'll get over this. We're going to come over top of this trouble, and we're going to make it better. We're going to do it quickly. They were convinced that they would rise. And there was no return to the Lord when that affliction came. They clamored over the ruins. They claimed that the difficulties were temporary. This was just a passing thing. But it was God's judgment over their pride. And as such, he was going to send, to, send it to them those who Ephraim considered as allies or friends against them. See verse 11. The Lord will set up the adversaries of Rezin against him and spur his enemies on. But wait a minute, we saw in the previous chapters these weren't their enemies. What is he saying? The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, 
will devour Israel with an open mouth. Syria coming from the east and the Philistines coming from the west were going to come in and attack Israel of the north. They would come in from the front and from behind to devour them. Those whom they trusted in were not there to be their friends. They were not there to help them. They were there to destroy them. Here were the nations who were supposed to be on their side, and yet they came against them. God was using what was close to them, what they held dear, to bring down their pride and their self-reliance, to show them that their wisdom and their way would bring destruction because they would not turn to the Lord. Then in verses 13, or 13 through 17, follow along there. For the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. The elder and honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Against irreligion and hard-heartedness, where sin is a departure from God, repentance would be a return to him. But the people had already chosen not to see the hand of God in their destruction. They did not turn to him. They did not use this opportunity to seek him, either for help or for mercy, or as we saw in the story, for forgiveness. This comes back to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. If you'll remember, where did they look there for guidance? He said, when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? They were seeking the dead rather than the living. They were seeking after idols and spirits rather than the living God who alone could save them. It's a terrible and sorrowful plight, these verses. Just notice what it says here. They do not turn to him nor seek the Lord. They will be cut off. They're teaching lies. They're leading the people in error. The Lord has no joy in them, and he has no mercy on them. They're hypocrites. They're evildoers. They speak folly. In thought, in deed, in word, they were irreligious and alienated from God. He says they were hypocrites. They were calling themselves spiritual. They were calling themselves Christian. They were calling themselves religious. They were following the letter of the law. And yet they were doing evil. They were not seeking wisdom and understanding as for gold and silver, as Solomon commands, but out of the heart, their mouth was speaking folly. So do you call yourself a Christian, but you don't act like one? Do you think that you know something or that you're smart, that you should be listened to, and yet what you say is foolish, that tears down instead of building up? Such is the person who does not receive the correction of the Lord. Those who do not turn to him, who, who do not seek his counsel or his forgiveness or his wisdom. Wicked, it, it, the irreligion and hard-heartedness is, is the same as a godless man. He's one who does not, it's not one who denies the existence of God only, but he's a man who ignores the existence of God. It's easy enough to find someone who will say that they deny the existence of God, and yet in practice they're not denying it. But it's a hard issue of, of even ignoring the existence of God. Someone who can live from Monday to Saturday, and, and oftentimes right through Sunday, without ever thinking about God at all. It's people of God who can live as though God does not exist. Sometimes we do it even when we come to church, perhaps. We come to a service and, and we forget to realize that God is in this place. We are here to worship him, not ourselves. It's that he might get a blessing, not you. It doesn't mean that you don't get a blessing. 
It doesn't mean that this doesn't benefit. But to what purpose do we come and worship him? Do we come out of the service thinking, well, that service didn't really please me. Songs didn't really fit. Didn't really get anything out of the message. So, you know, that's the kind of day it was. And we've come with a heart that ignores the existence of who God is. Are we here to worship him? Are we here to please him? Are we here to be a blessing and a sweet aroma to him? That's what we've been created for. It's not about what we get out of it. It's not about whether we enjoy it or not. Because we can live our lives as if we can get on without him, if that's the case. The Lord says what he's going to do. He's going to cut off the head and tail, the branch and the bulrush. And yet he explains that illustration to us right there. He says, the elder and the honorable are the head. The prophet who teaches lies are the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. So it's the elders and the honorables, the leader of the people who are the head. They will be cut off. It's the prophet who lies, who tells what the itching ears want to hear. If I were here just to tell you what I thought you wanted to hear every Sunday, then you should cut me off. Because then it would be a pile of lies pretty quick. Those will be cut off. That's the tale. The leaders were the branches reaching above and over all. The bulrushes or the lower, the lower grasses or the lower class. All of it will be destroyed, he said. There's nowhere that's going to be left undone. The leaders had led the nation to dis- destruction because of their unrepentant condition. So there was no class distinction here before God. For when sin comes in, it corrupts at every level. Corrupt leaders will corrupt their people. And it cut, sweeps in at every level. And so he moves to the third stanza of the poem in verse 18. For wickedness burns as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh. Together they shall be against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Their continual waywardness called for further judgment. Men may think lightly of sin and pay little or no attention to its evil effects, but if they persist in rebellion against God, they will find that wickedness does indeed burn as a fire and that those who refuse to turn to God in repentance will have to endure the judgment that they have brought on themselves. From H.A. Ironside. So when God's restraining hand of grace is removed, then wickedness rises up like a fire. It comes in and destroys and eats everything that it touches. Wickedness and godlessness or selfishness are the sins that bear the seed of retribution and destruction. It's wanting what you do not have that eats you up. It burns. It licks at your thoughts. It kindles in the things that you say. But in the end, it causes you to crash and to burn. Instead of turning to God, though, they turned on each other. You see how the effects of sin have come here. As the wickedness burns, as the wrath of the Lord comes upon the land, no one would spare their brother. They would snatch on the right in their hunger. They would turn on the left, and they would not be satisfied. And they turned on each other. Here he pictures the two sons of Joseph. Joseph, who was sent to Egypt, who rose to power through obedience to the Lord, was given two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Those two sons were were the ones who received an inheritance in Israel. Notice Joseph, who was a son of, of Jacob, didn't receive an inheritance in Israel, but his two sons did. They were a part of the 12 tribes, and they are part of the north there. These two brothers as they're pictured here, 
were engaging in civil war. They were fighting one another. And what was the only thing that stopped them from fighting each other? Well, was it the fact that they saw their, their wickedness and they turned from it? Should have been. Uh, was it the fact that they realized, wait a minute, we're brothers. We're, we're created to love one another. We're family here. Family doesn't fight like this. No, the only thing that stops them, the only thing that causes them to be united is that they turn on Judah. Well, but he's one of Israel as well. He, he is part of God's promised people. That's where Jerusalem is, their capital city. But they unite for a moment to fight against Judah. God is watching as his children begin to fight each other. James pointed out pretty evidently in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Isn't this the effects of godlessness and wickedness? It's a desire that's sown and sprouts into lust. That we're continually thinking about it, continually longing for it. And then it grows in, into, into full growth. And that leads to murder, which Jesus said was hatred in your heart in thought or in deed. It, it leads to coveting, which is the breaking of God's law. You remember the Ten Commandments, you shall not covet. And finally, on attacking one another and fighting in war, James was writing to the church. He wasn't just writing to Israel. He was writing to the church. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Because you lust and do not have, because of your wickedness that burns as a fire. And then in the fourth stanza here, in chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, injustice and unrighteousness. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune, which they have prescribed, to rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that the fatherless, and that they may rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of punishment? and in the desolation which will come from afar. To whom will you flee for help, and where will you leave your glory? Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners, and they shall fall among the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So I ask, what is the spiritual purpose for having judges and leaders over groups of people? Why do we call for judges? Well, I believe, as McGee points out, that judges and leaders are to display and reveal God's justice and are therefore answerable to him for their actions. So injustice or bribery and corruption were on display as the leaders used the law to rob the widows and the fatherless. We don't have time this morning to look at what God has to say about fatherless and widows. But all throughout Scripture, through the Old Testament, reinforced in the New Testament, God is a defender of the fatherless. He is a defender of the widows. He is there for them. He is a comfort. He is a provider and a protector for them. Not these leaders. They had the, they had the, right, they had the responsibility to uphold what was right, to maintain justice. But instead, they chose to pursue the lust of their flesh, taking what was not theirs, defrauding one another of all property, so that their treasures and their valuables became substitutes for God. It was an economic system that was built upon the disregard of the rights of the poor, and we see it would be destroyed. Lawmakers making laws that would force that which is not right upon the people so that when they wrote the laws that would incur misfortune on others, they robbed the needy of justice. It took what is right from the poor. Surely we couldn't imagine how bad a nation must be who would prey on the helpless elderly widows. People who have worked hard for retirement and savings, who are suffering loneliness and heartache, who are being defrauded and then taken to the bank. 
Or consider the evil state of a government that would go to children who have no father to lead them or provide them or protect them and rob them of what little is left of their sense of security and comfort. It's a tragedy. That should, that should be rending at our hearts right now. I wasn't sure if I would share this, but I will. When a three-year-old child is mistreated and lost and the adults responsible don't answer, justice demands an answer, doesn't it? Justice says there has to be an answer for this. Someone has to answer. When a 10-year-old disappears, doesn't it break your heart? Can you hear the cry? This isn't right. This isn't right for a people. Or if we go half a world away, now we're really disconnected. We we're not as connected with Israel as we think we are. I don't think anyone in this room is related to somebody living in Israel right now. So go half a world away. If it weren't for the internet and the resources that make us aware, when a group that is bent on evil kills men, women, and children without regard, senselessly, then a holy indignation should be rising up. That should cause our hearts to break. That should cause us to become angry. There is a righteous anger. Jesus became angry when the Pharisees were using the house of God for a place to sell and to gain profit. God is angry when justice and righteousness are not upheld as the truth. And that's what we see four times in this text. That until these four things are removed, until... Pride is removed and arrogance until irreligion and, <clears throat> oh, now I've forgotten it. Until irreligion and hard-heartedness are removed, until wickedness and selfishness are removed and injustice and unrighteousness are removed, then God's chastening will remain. For all this, he says, it's the statement that re is repeated as the close of each phrase. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Isaiah is teaching here that the whole situation arose from God's anger. The reason for God's wrath was the people's iniquities in administering the laws and his subsequent harsh treatment of those in need. The in injustice was displayed through their bribery and co corruption. David Pawson said, justice can only be achieved if those people who are not directly affected by a wrong are just as indignant about it as those who are personally hurt. So God's anger is his love thrown back upon itself from unreceptive and unloving hearts, like a wave that would roll in smooth and unbroken and green in beauty into the open door of some sea cave is dashed back in spray and foam from some grim rock. You can read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 39 later, but note especially verse 31, which says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's what Isaiah is pointing out. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We do need to think soberly and righteously in this day. Paul puts it into his letter in Romans and reiterates the same principal warning for all people today. He says in verse 2, we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, 
who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. So the prophet puts forth these three questions at the conclusion of the poem that's meant to bear weight on the hearts and minds of the Israelites in that day. And it should be a warning to us as well. That we should be pondering, these are to be pondered by every person who wants to be ready when the Lord comes. Because he doesn't say if he comes. It doesn't say if the day of the Lord happens or if judgment occurs. It will happen. The day of the Lord will come. There will be a judgment. So in that day, if you want to be ready, if you want to be prepared for that moment, hear the questions Isaiah says. What will you do in the day of punishment and in the desolation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? What will you do, he says, when Syria and the Philistines come against you, when your allies come against you, and you are judged. Who are you going to flee, flee for help in that time? You who are confident that you can meet every situation, who think that all wisdom resides in man, judgment is coming, mighty, gathering force. So flee to him alone, who alone can save from the wrath to come. That's Isaiah's call. Flee to the Lord who alone can save. In that day, will you remain unchanged or hardened or prideful? Or will you be softened to the correction and turn from wickedness? Will you look for help from the government or from friends? Or will you seek the Lord and take refuge in his help? Will your glory be wrapped up in things that you've obtained? Or will it be in humility that you glory in grace, that you glory in Jesus Christ, who has become your salvation? For if God cannot bring a people, specifically his people, to repentance through his word, that is what he said here, that they were taking what is right from the poor of my people. If he cannot bring us to repentance through his word, then he must lift his hand and chasten. And if we do not submit to his chastening, then he will judge us. Because we cannot have, you cannot have your own way. You cannot have your pet sins and God's mercy and experience his great love and receive the free gift of eternal life without turning away from the former humbly coming to the one. Come now. Here's what Hebrews 12 says. Hebrews 12, verse 9 through 11. We have had human fathers who corrected us. We paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems pleasant for the present, but it is painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So the call is to make ready your hearts, to be subject to the Father, because his desire is for your profit, to make you holy as he is holy, to help you provide that you would yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness in your life. But lest anyone be tempted to think that God, who is angry with the wicked every day, is only out for judgment, only out for punishment, Isaiah puts forth God's promise or his purpose in chapter 55, verses 6 and 7, when he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. 
and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's why he sent his only son. That's why Jesus went obediently to the cross for our sin and died, to show that he is a God who is long-suffering, who bears patiently, who chastens, but that it's so that he would draw people to himself, that they would turn from their wicked ways and seek him. It was to show his mercy, which is more than the weight of all our sin, that we might seek a communion with God that involves prayer for help and guidance, involves walking with him and following his word. The instruction that James leaves us in James 4, verses 7 through 10, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So let not a people be prideful and irreligious, hard-hearted or selfish or wicked, but let them turn to God who alone can help. Let us turn from our ways. As a country, may we turn from our ways. As a people individually, seek your heart. You might turn from our ways and, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, with whom is found plenteous mercy and grace, with whom there is forgiveness. O oh God, we come before you. And it is humbly that we come and bow ourselves before your presence. Because you are a holy God, and in your presence there is no evil. There is no darkness. There is no shadow of turning with you. You are just. You are righteous. All that you decree is right and good. Even in your wrath and anger. Even in the judgment that you decree. Your purpose and your design is that people would turn to the Lord and they would seek you. That people would look to you who have created them for help. That they would look to you who have made a way of salvation. God, I pray that you would put it on the hearts of every person. Here, in the community, in our country, I pray for the country of Israel and for those in Palestine. You would put it on their hearts. Your desires for justice and for what is right. You do not desire to see wars and fights among your people. But God, I pray that you would use these things to turn people's hearts to the Lord that you would use it to open blind eyes to see the truth. That where pride and hard-heartedness and wickedness reign, you would come in and break down the walls. You would come in and soften our hearts. That we would be honoring and pleasing to you. We come and forgive and ask forgiveness as we repent and and turn away from those things. Help us to give you glory in all that we do and say. Help us to come before you as a holy God and to approach you as such. To worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we close with the, hymn, the song, Only a Holy God. Would we behold him? Would we cry out to him? Because the song we will sing forever is that he is holy and we will worship him. Come 
friends, all the hosts of heaven. Who else could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy. Consumed like fire. What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Come and behold him. The one and the only cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. could rescue me from my failing who else would offer his only son who else invites me to call him father only a holy God only my holy God Sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy. Thank you. 